My name is Samuel Singer, and I think I've seen something I shouldn't have. That's not exactly unusual. As a reporter, I'm often actively seeking out events and situations that people have tried to keep buried. An element of secrecy. Forbidden knowledge. It's precisely what makes a good story. Usually. But I've learned something these past few days. I've learned that I'm not nearly as brave as I once thought I was. I've learned that there are darker corners of the world around me than I could have ever possibly imagined. And I learned that sometimes, even when confronted with such a dark corner, the last thing you should do is turn on a light. Now let me take you back to last Tuesday. Firstly, it was raining, which was a problem. Though it's all too common in Habitsville, I've learned to hate the rain. I find it too on the nose in horror films and too cliche in romantic ones. In town, it would settle a smell of smog and cigarettes over the paved streets that couldn't have been escaped, not even by going inside. But last Tuesday, at least, I wasn't in Habitsville. I was traveling with my co-worker Heather to Rhodes Creek, a few towns over. Despite its closeness to Habitsville, I'd never visited. Even when I was younger, I remember my parents taking the long way around when we needed to get across the state. I understood that. If I had kids, I probably wouldn't want to bring them in the area either. See, Rhodes Creek has a bit of a reputation. In 1980, three children went missing. Two boys, one girl. All around 10 and 11 years old. Vanished one night. It was summer. And the days were long, so parents figured that they would be out playing in the vacant streets as children do. They surely just lost track of time, at least that's what the town thought. Though the 80s might have been a time of more relaxed curfews and comfortability when leaving doors unlocked, panic still ensued when children went missing, especially if they're gone for three days. Three days. That's how long the children had been gone when the first arrest was made. Or should I say arrests, plural, a couple, Henry and Rosemary McAfee. They were brought in for questioning, and then charged the very same day. It seemed that there were multiple eyewitnesses' accounts placing the missing trio around their home, and one watchful neighbor reported that they had seen the children enter the house and never come out. The arrests had shocked the town, and I could see why. The McAfees had seemed like normal, nice people up until that point. They had moved there only a few years prior, had lived in a good part of town, and had a large, well-kept property, although they tended to keep to themselves. They were an attractive couple, and all the photos I'd seen of them seemed to lack that cringeworthy, out-of-date feeling to them. They didn't have the big hair, overdone eyeshadow, or huge mustaches that were typical of the decade. They were clean-cut, good-looking, classic is how I might describe them. The appearance and good standing of the couple wasn't the only thing that sent a chill through the community. The third boy that had gone missing had been Tommy McAfee, Henry and Rosemary's only child. The rumors ran rampant through Road Creek. Some still thought the children had just gone lost, but many had begun to think that the McAfees were really responsible. They had murdered the children and disposed of their bodies, even that of their own son. Some considered the possibility that they had used Tommy to lure the other two to them, and then killed all three. Some still thought that the children were still hidden within the house. So a search warrant was procured, and the couple that had once been so private prepared to have their home rifled through by police as the town murmured amongst themselves. But then, just before the search took place, something happened. All three children came back. Well, they seemed tired and perhaps a, few, a bit disoriented, but they were otherwise unharmed. All three gave testimonies stating that they had merely gotten lost in an unfamiliar area in the nearby woods and had trouble finding their way back. A wave of relief and, to some extent, disappointment swept through the town as the children returned to their families. The McAfees were released and regained their son. Over the next few years, the other two children and their families moved away. Though I've made several attempts, I can't seem to find current addresses or contact information for either of them. Tommy McAfee, on the other hand, 
stayed. Tommy came back into the public light a few weeks ago, when the local newspaper announced that his parents had both died in a car accident, leaving Tommy the sole inheritor of the property. This was when I reached out to him. He didn't respond. Not that I really thought he would. There hadn't been a peep out of him or his family since the events of 1980, and I doubted he wanted a reporter coming in and stirring things up, but it was nearly the anniversary of his own disappearance as a child, and so I figured it was now or never. I wanted to know what really happened those three days in the summer of 1980. I didn't believe that three children who had lived in Rhodes Creek all of their albeit short lives could suddenly get lost in their own hometown. There were woods in the area, but from my research, they aren't thick. And that one witness was stuck in my mind. The one who claimed the children actually went into the McCaveys' home and didn't come out. And neither Henry nor Rosemary testified to seeing the three children that night, claiming that they hadn't ever seen their son since he'd left for the park in the early afternoon. And then there was the children's testimonies themselves. Through methods I'd rather not divulge, I've been able to look at the actual transcripts from the original police reports. Here's what they said. Name, redacted. Girl. We had been out playing. We stayed out later than we meant to. Tommy said that he knew a shortcut back into town through the woods. But we got lost partway through. We kept walking through the night. We drank water from the creek. One day we saw the road and we walked home. Name, redacted. The boy. We'd been out playing. Uh, we stayed out later than we meant to. I said I knew a shortcut through the woods back into town. Part of the way through we got lost. We drank water from the creek. We kept walking through the night. One day we saw the road and we went home. Separate accounts. Given by different people. And none being able to sit in on the testimony of the others. And yet... They're virtually identical in context, structure, and diction. Something wasn't right. Heather had been interested. Because she's like me, she's fascinated with mysterious happenings, even those that happened three decades ago. But she's far more outgoing than I am, so it was her that proposed that we drop in on Tommy McAfee, unannounced on this rainy July day, and I, because I can't shake the feeling that I haven't gotten the full story yet, said yes. Something else happened in those three days. Something that had been buried for thirty years, and if there's one thing I can't escape, it's my desire to dig. You know the saying, curiosity killed the cat? Whenever someone recites that to me, I always like to answer with the rest of the phrase, but satisfaction brought it back. It helps me justify my need to stick my nose into places it doesn't belong. But the end always justifies the means. But this... This was a mistake. Heather and I pay Tommy McAfee an unexpected visit in Rhodes Creek. Next time. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify, or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube, or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. If any of you guys are interested in some of the audiobooks or actual books that have horror stories in them that I've worked on, you can always check out that description down below. In there, there's a couple of different links to some horror books and horror audiobooks and new things, like hopefully there'll be a Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 link down there in the next few days, which I'm referring to right now, because if you look and it's out, it'll be there. <laughs> also, I wanted to say thank you all of you 
who are supporting me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charan, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Ryan Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy Halloween. Sweet dreams.